My name is Musa, the son of Adnan, the son of Abdul Rashid. This is I'm Ustad Adnan, the son Adnan. of Abdul Rashid, the son of Ahmed, the son of Muhammad Idris, the son of Muhammad Ismail, Muhammad Ismail the son of Muhammad Amin Hajuddin, the son of Sirajuddin, the son of Hafiz Mustaqim. Rahmatullahi alayhim. Shocking, Ajma'in. And here's what we have coming up next. This is something we have to explain to the masses out there. Yeah. Muslims cannot be destroyers. Yeah. We cannot be destroyers. Our civilization doesn't stand for destruction. Ashab Rasul could not dream of the food you have today. The food you have on your tables, I'm talking to all the Muslims around the world. The desserts, the drinks, the juices, the cocktails, Tiramisu. Uh, the type of the types of rice you eat. Assalamu alaikum. How's things? Alhamdulillah. How have you been? I've been fine. How's things in the house? All good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, it's good. So, another podcast with you. How does it feel to be back? Same. Same, yeah. Normal. Normal. Average day. Alhamdulillah. So, basically, guys, we're going to start off with a quick fire round mm-hmm. because who loves a quick fire, eh? Mm-hmm. A lot of people do. Okay. So, um, Pakistan or UK? Difficult question. It's both. A, it, yeah, you have to, like, it's quick fire. So, okay, it both. has to be quick answers. Both, yeah. Biryani or Mandi? Both. Mandi is for me. Car or motorbike? Car. Android or Apple? Android. Allah yahdikum, inshallah. I mean. I mean, to the path of Apple. What is your um, favorite place in the world? Not Makkah Medina, favorite place, or like other than Makkah Medina? North Wales. North Wales? Mm. Really? Mm. It's giving you a different kind of feeling. Nice. Coffee or tea? Tea. Tea, yeah. I like coffee, I think. Favorite food? Good question. Favorite food? Uh, I would say kidney beans, cooked in the Pakistani way. Subhanallah, I'm learning things about my father now. Hmm. Shocking. Mecca or Medina? Definitely Mecca. I'm Medina, I think. I'm Definitely Mecca. Al Bake or KFC? Al Bake. Pizza Hut or Domino's? Domino's. That sauce in it, the, the green yeah, sauce. Yeah, the sauce and the, the, the fact that it's thin crust. Thin crust. Hmm. Cricket, Pakistan or India? Come on, man. Okay, India. Samosa or Pakora? Um, Pakora. Favorite ayah in the Quran right now? Right now, the favorite ayah in the Quran, Allahu Akbar. There are many few, uh, but one of them is one. Uh, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. I didn't think of that one. But my most, I, I would say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ nice. That's one of the verses I quote most often. What does that mean? We have sent you not except as a mercy for the worlds. Allahu Akbar. How far back can you name your ancestors? Well, you actually About just done it. S- seven generations. Yeah. How many years do you think that is? About two and a half centuries. All right, nice. Which scholar from the past inspires you the most? Which scholar from the past you were inspires to put like me the most? Wow. I have few. Uh, I would name two. Go on. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. Yeah, that's me. And Shah Waliullah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can speak a bit more about I that. mean, if I want to be historically correct or politically correct, of course, there is a long list of scholars. Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, yeah. Imam Ashafi, Imam Bukhari, and other Aima, Sufyan Authority. There is a long list of great giants we uh, we have in our history uh, effectively we are standing on the shoulders of giants yeah, without Allah. knowing the giants unfortunately Subhanallah. but there are there's a long list but to if i was to say most recently people who have inspired me the most i would say shah waliullah hmm. and ibn taymiyyah partly yeah i don't want to like digress but like sh- just very quickly shah hmm. waliullah like what what was he, what 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 stands up you know what stands up because I'm sure many people haven't even heard of him. He was a combination of Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah. Really? Yes, okay. Absolutely. And his works he in had, Arabic. He had the, he had the, the the spiritual dynamics of Ghazali, and he had the legal knowledge of Ibn Taymiyyah. Nice. He was a muhaddith, by the way. He was a muhaddith. Mm. He was a master of hadith, 
and his history is absolutely fascinating which we cannot indulge in yeah, at yeah. this point yes inshallah maybe the people can check him out mm. um favorite companion and why or the favorite prophet, like companion so. of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and why you are asking me questions i've never really actually thought about because there again there's a long list of companions with different virtues but like right now um, maybe like you done the uh, khutbah today mashallah yeah. it was really really good yeah, and like yeah. right now maybe if what name comes in your head it doesn't need to be like your favorite forever but like what comes in yeah. your head right now i would say aisha radiyallahu anha really okay and and uh, and i would say i would say ali bin abi talib radiyallahu an um because of the because of the things they went through together mm-hmm, you know mm-hmm. uh I would say these two. In men, I would say Ali bin Abi Talib. Not that I don't love Abu Bakr and Omar. Of course, yeah. uh, of course they are the greatest companions. Again, that would be being poli- politically and historically correct yeah, about yeah. Islam because everyone loves Abu but, Bakr. But we're Omar. trying to speak about. I would it, yeah. say, I would say, people who really inspire me, uh, apart from Abu Bakr and Omar uh, and Uthman, Ali bin Abi Talib is definitely. In fact, Imam Ahmad was of the opinion that he has uh, some of the biggest virtues. to his credit in Islam you know amazing subhanallah yeah. uh your favorite reciter currently i would say saad al ghamidi nice yeah you've always said him mm. favorite book currently? currently other than the quran other than the quran my favorite book again there are few books um i'm reading and it's, it's a very difficult question to s- someone who's uh, who has a library of 4000 books Okay, little stunt, so, little flex, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I would say there are quite a few items. Uh I don't know, I don't know. There are so Just many. Just mention I, one book that comes um, into your head, like one that that um one book that comes to my head. I would say uh Sayyuti's Tarikhul Khulafa okay. is a very good place to start with. Okay. You know, uh I've I've read it I read it a while back. So it's history it is, of the it, Khulafa. Yeah, if history of the Khulafa from Khulafa Ar Rashidin all the way going down to Abbasids and Abbas. Umayyads and all that. Yeah. Okay. And most amazing new country you've been to, like recently? Maybe it's a new country you visited that you really liked, because you travel a lot, of course. Amazing new country. Absolutely interesting. Okay. I've again, I've been to so many countries, so this is a quick I can't fire. Really? Okay. Uh, this so is a quick to, fire. So really. To, you know, so you need to ask me questions that just that quick, deserve quick, a quick just, answer. You, you just know? give a quick answer. Um. I would say Tanzania. Okay, nice one. Favorite form of exercise, if you have one. Walking. Nice. I like walking as well. Morning person or night person? I should answer night this person. for you. You're Come definitely on. a night person as well. Yeah. Sometimes I struggle to sleep at home because of yeah. you know what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> favorite product that you use? Do you use any products? I use perfumes. I like uh, yeah. that one uh, thousand and one night. Nice. Thousand okay. and one night. Yeah. Okay, nice. Ajmal, yes. Ajmal, that's the one, that's the one that they were talking about earlier. Okay, so now we're going to get straight into um the episode. Last time you were on Rerooted, mashallah, we spoke about different things. We learned a little bit more about yourself, your background, your history, your your upbringing, some of the things you went through when you came to this country uh from Pakistan, of course, where you were raised up until maybe 17, 18. And now you're here, mashallah, you've been involved in da'wah work. You're you're fairly known amongst the Muslim community, alhamdulillah. So One of the things that you pride yourself I'm sure in being um one of your fields rather you know everyone has their like fun as we say in the Arabic language like their field one of your fields we can say is is history right so the first question I want to start of this discussion with inshallah is how can our knowledge in history benefit us in becoming closer to Allah and giving da'wah because history um is very neglected even maybe by some people who study Islam maybe they don't put aside time sometimes to study history and it's something that can be very very easily overlooked why do you feel like history is so important bismillah rahman rahim thank you for for inviting me for another podcast history is absolutely crucial in islam because the quran makes history an example to teach humanity allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses history repeatedly in the quran uh, as an example or as uh, as an argument to establish his case so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again for example in a number of places states a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem hal ataka hadith musa for example has the story or the news of musa reached you alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ad do you not see what happened to the people of ad what your lord did with the people of ad okay and for example um uh 
there are other examples uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the history of Banu Israel. Allah talks about previous prophets. Allah talks about previous nations, Ad and Thamud and Banu Israel and Fir'aun and uh, the people of Ibrahim. Okay, all these examples Allah gives to, to do what? To get people to realize that Allah is the ultimate power. Allah is the ultimate source of success. Allah is the ultimate source of everything in life. And Allah deserves to be worshipped. Allah alone will last. Nothing will last. Nothing will last. As magnificent as previous civilizations may be, uh, as powerful, as oppressive, as tyrannical, as progressive as previous civilizations may be, none of them lasted. None of them will last. The ones we have today will crumble eventually. What will remain is what you have done with those civilizations how you used your power, how you used your influence and your potential to do well. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly draws our attention to what happened in the past. Yes. In one particular verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the believers and others to go and look in the land what happened before you came. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Siru fil ard. Go in the land and see what happened before you. Why is Allah telling you to go and see in the land? Um, and Allah specifically states, though, go and see what happened to those who denied Allah. SubhanAllah. Who denied Allah. The successful ones. The, the, uh, allegedly. Uh, yeah, allegedly people who left great monuments behind, they are all in ruin. Like the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks, the Romans, some of the best temples, some of the best monuments. I mean, I happened to uh, be in Libya just before the war happened. Unfortunately, the war has devastated the country. Yes. It was, it, it, it is, it, it was one of the most beautiful countries in the world in many ways. Yeah, I was it, with it, you. It, yeah, absolutely. You were there with me. Absolutely. Yeah. And you remember the city of uh, Leptis. Leptis. Man yeah, yeah. Yeah. Le yeah. Man you remember the monuments? Yeah, it yeah. was said that Leptis is the, the best preserved Roman city in the world after Rome itself. Yeah. Okay. And I am pretty sure it's been devastated by the war. Uh, there's a lot of van vandalism, theft of monuments and, and damage. Uh, caused by you know different fractions fighting in yeah. the war to raise funds for themselves because they sell all these items in some of my so, classes they actually even mentioned uh, yeah. I'm sorry to come in but like they actually even mentioned you know on that point mm. they mentioned that how um, uh, um, when I was studying archaeology of Greece and Rome yeah. the lecturer she actually went over her, her way to show pictures and it actually hurt yeah. you know it kind of hurt it hurt me like as a student of history because she 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 mentioned like all of these like pictures she said and guess what they've been destroyed now by ISIS yes they, there's no there's no remains of these unfortunately. things unfortunately so like you can't even look at how these people were to kind of ponder this is it. something we have to explain to the masses out there yeah. muslims cannot be destroyers yeah we cannot be destroyers our civilization doesn't stand for destruction we cannot destroy monuments history historical evidence, manuscripts, books, anything to do with history, we have to preserve it. Yeah. Why? Because the Quran tells us, Siru fil ard, fanduru kayfa kana aqibatul muqaddimin. Go in the land and see what happened to those who denied Allah. So if you don't preserve it, <laughs> yeah, that's a good yeah, point. Yeah. How, how are people going to see it? How will the future generations take lessons from that's them? Interesting point. So if you are systematically with chisels and hammers are going smashing everything that comes your way, don't you think the Sahaba had the ability to do it? Did the Sahaba um, rule Iraq? Yeah. Did they rule Libya? It's interesting. Uh, did point. they rule? Did they rule parts of uh, Persia? Yeah, they did. Yeah. And those men, those monuments have survived Subhanallah. for ISIS to destroy. So these people, if they had any sense. They would look at the Sahaba, Tabi'een. Some of the greatest armies in the world, some of the most powerful armies in the world were the Muslim armies under the Umayyads, the Abbasids. They had enough power to destroy all these monuments in Iraq, in Persia, in Egypt, in uh, okay, uh, in Libya, or all of North Africa. And they didn't. Right? They didn't. Why didn't this? Because they... Do you think Leptis would, it wasn't seen by the Sahaba? They, they had no idea? Absolutely. Uh, do you, do you think uh, Palmyra 
wasn't seen by the Sahaba? Do you think all the Babylonian remains and Assyrian remains in Iraq and northern Iraq, they, they, the Sahaba were blind to them or the Tabi'een or the later Muslims, they were blind to them? No, they preserved them. They, preserve, they left them for people to see. Go and see. Well, Allah, Allah is saying in the Quran, go and see what happened to those who denied Allah. So these people, despite their power, despite their strength, despite the fact that they were able to do all these great things, what happened to them? They perished because they denied Allah. The reality is Allah, your God, your creator. If you don't turn to him, nothing will remain. It doesn't matter if you built like the Colosseum. And, it doesn't matter. You know, It doesn't matter. It will simply stand as a reminder. It will stand as a reminder for the rest of humanity to look at it and wonder what happened to these people. They perished. And it's amazing because the point you mentioned is not actually hypothetical. Because you even there's a there's a there's a scholar of the past. His name is Ibn Al Wardi, hmm. and he wrote a, a poem which is famous, Lamia. You can hmm. even listen to it on YouTube. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it ends with Lam, hmm. and he um, he is called the Lamia of Ibn Al Wardi, and yeah. he actually speaks in it. It's an advice to, he gave to his son. Hmm. And in it, he actually specifically mentions, look at Caesar. He mentions specific examples. Mm. Look at their end. And he's using it in his poem. Absolutely. And of course, the Quran probably inspired him to yes. do that. Yes. So scholars actually done this of the past. Great scholars of the past. They've done this. Yes. They, looked, they looked and they wrote on these people. So Yeah, it, look at the Pharaoh. I mean, the body of Pharaoh, Ramses II, it is claimed. Uh, was was uh, the, the body, Pharaoh Musa. Yeah, the, yeah, the I mean, it's is. claimed that he was the, the, the Pharaoh of Musa. Alayhi salam. Uh, we don't know how true that claim is. But his body, Ramses II, his body can be found in the Cairo Museum, right? Yeah, yeah. You go and see it. It is bones and flesh. You can see his nails as well, his I think. You can see his hair. You can yeah. see. And this is the man who built all those giant monuments. His period was seen as a golden age for Egyptian monuments, right? Some of the best monuments or the, some, of the, some, of the, some of the biggest monuments uh, were created during his reign. Yes. He, he reigned for a very long time, mm. okay? And those monuments still stand. But look at his body. You know, you feel sorry for him. But at the same time, he was one of those people who denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at his end. Yeah. Allah has made him an example in Surah Yunus, verse 94, if I'm not mistaken. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about it, that your body, you will be pre preserved for posterity to take lessons from your example. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So... I'm sure, like, just based on the things that you mentioned, Jazakumullah khair on that, like, we, we can use this in the da'wah, right? Absolutely. There's many ways that we can use this Absolutely. in the da'wah. So I work, actually want to zoom in on a specific point. Going to early uh, Islamic history, many of the Sahaba, we find their graves, like Abu Darda, radiallahu anhu, mm. he's buried in Damascus. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, alongside his wife, she's also buried in Damascus. And we find other companions also buried in different parts of the land mm. outside of Arabia. Hmm. Outside of Arabia, yeah. why were these companions traveling outside of Arabia after the death of the Prophet ﷺ? Because the Prophet had commanded them to deliver from me to those who are absent, Hajjatul Wada, four months before the Prophet ﷺ passed away. He stood in front of a hundred thousand companions. It is estimated it were a hundred thousand people, and he said to them, "Have I delivered?" And they all unanimously responded, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, you have delivered. He said, Okay, now those who are present, take the message to those who are absent. So that was the primary purpose of the adventures, the journeys, the travels of the Sahaba and Tabi'een, and Taba Tabi'een. Okay, some of them are buried in North Africa. Can we hear some names, like of like where, where some of them went? And Okay, most of them we have no idea where they went and where they, they got buried. Okay. Over 90% of the Sahaba of Rasulullah are completely unknown to us, okay? And we don't know where they're buried. We know 10,000 of them by name. Okay. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is the only human in human history who is known by his companions to this extent. There is not another historical figure in history of Islam or the history of humanity who, whose, whose, whose companions are known simply by the virtue of being connected to this man. Imagine that. I mean, we had great leaders, I mean, great in the sense of the, the, the influence and the impact and the power they exercised in human history, for example. I mean, some of them are recent people. Napoleon Bonaparte. I don't know if we can call him great. Because well, you have significant figures, even Hitler. Si si yeah, so, I mean, si significant figures who... In did, history, significant in yeah, history, yeah. Yeah, you don't know their companions. Yeah. Not that many. 
You don't know 10,000 companions of Napoleon. You don't know 10,000 companions of Churchill, uh, or, Churchill or, or Hitler. Or, with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know 10,000 companions by name. One of the books you can go to is Usud al-Ghaba fi Ma'rifat al-Sahaba, compiled by Imam Ibn al -Athir. He has put over 8,000 biographies of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu in this particular compendium. Okay, it is an encyclopedia of information on the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wow. Okay, some of them are only known because they reported one hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah. Wow. Some of them are only known by the virtue of reporting a sentence about the Prophet or from him. That's why their name got preserved. So Allah honored them simply by the fact that they said something about the Prophet Sallallahu They taught something about him. They said he did this, he said this, or he affirmed, or he confirmed such and such action. Yeah, yeah. And their history, their name, their tribe, their life was preserved uh, until the Day of Judgment, so long as these books last. For the science of... One of the, exam yeah. one of the examples I can give you, uh, Jarhad bin Khuwaylad al-Aslami. Yeah. Jarhad bin Khuwaylad al-Aslami. There is dispute about his name. Uh, among the muhaddithin, whether it's Jarhad bin uh, Khawailad or is it Jarhad al-Aslami, uh, simply Jarhad al-Aslami. He is only known by one hadith reported by Tirmizi. If you go and check his name in Usul al-Ghaba, you will see that there's only one report by him about the fact that the thigh of a man is aura. Wow. Okay, <laughs> subhanallah. Okay, of course, Imam Bukhari took a different view. <laughs> Imam, Imam Bukhari, without mentioning the hadith in Bukhari, Sahih al Bukhari, he refutes this view by bringing the hadith of Anas bin Malik as a response that Anas saw the thigh of the Prophet ﷺ while he was riding the camel with him. So, this means thigh cannot be necessarily uh, aura. Okay, and Imam so there is, he took that uh, view as well. well. I mean, there is ikhtilaf among the ulama, depending yeah. on which view they take. Yeah? yeah, the point I'm making is Jarhad is only known. By one hadith. Yes. We only know this there's a man called Jarhad al Aslami existed because he reported a report from the Prophet. So there are many examples like that. Okay. So we have ten thousand companions of the Prophet. Most of them, okay, even these ten thousand, of course there were there were over a hundred thousand companions. We don't know their names, we don't know where they died, where they lived. Okay. All of them, I can tell you, I can guarantee you those who spent time with the Prophet ﷺ were touched by his character, his nobility. Okay, you know this, what do you call it, the, the effect of someone's company. Yeah, okay, totally the yeah. nur of the Prophet ﷺ's character. It touched them all. Every single one of them was touched in some way. Do you think they sat down after that? Every single one of them did something, something good, something great, something positive, right? And these people, were some of the most uncivilized people in the world, you can say. The Arabs were semi-barbarized or semi-civilized, glasses half full, half empty, depending on how you want to see them, right? They became the most civilized people on the planet. The Prophet ﷺ single-handedly, through the teachings that were revealed to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he completely changed the characters of these humans who lived in Arabia. They became some of the most upright, some of the most morally influential people in the world. Yeah. They created what we call the Muslim civilization. They went all the way up to uh, Spain, and they were as far as uh, as far as China. They reached as far as China. Okay, some of the companions of the Prophet are buried in China. Okay, or close to the borders of China. Like Mo some, Muhammad bin Qasim went to India, right? Uh, well, he was he was not a companion. He was Tabi. Uh, he was a Tabi. You can say he was he, he was potentially a Tabi. Okay. Okay. Because he 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 went to India, a current day Pakistan, in the province of Sindh, in 92 Hijri, and they were companions of the Prophet alive even then. Okay. Anas bin Malik was alive. Anas bin Malik, one of the the companions of the Prophet who reported hundreds of reports from the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. He died in 94. So okay. Subhanallah, yeah. It's, it's it's clear to see that this uh, that this uh, the effect. One of the significant effects that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had yeah. as a Prophet, what was his job? It was to give da'wah to his nation and his people and call them. Yes. You know, um, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala tells the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran, yeah. Udu'u ila, ila sabili rabbik. Yes. Yeah, Udu'u ila sabili rabbik. Yes. Bil hikmah, etc. Yeah. So, 
this order that the Prophet وسلم, that was to the Prophet وسلم, primarily, of course he acted upon that. Yeah. You know, Ya قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَّهِرْ These orders yes. uh, in the Qur'an. Yes. And it's clear that the Sahaba also um, indirectly also took those th- that view, those orders. Not, direct, not indirectly. Indirectly directly. meaning from the Qur'an because yes. the Qur'an directly is to the Prophet Yeah, and when the Qur'an says أُدْعُوا أُدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكْ it's talking, it's, it's talking to everyone, yeah, all to the Muslims. Everyone, yeah, yeah. Okay, so... This is why the Prophet Sallallahu he <laughs> said to his companions, "Ballihu anni walau aya." Deliver for me, even if it's a sentence. So they went, even if it's a verse. So now yes. they went out to give yes. to give that dawah. Yes, and they, they, this is why they died in places like India, China, Persia, North Africa. They spread all over, and these were the, these were some of the most ill-equipped people in the world. They didn't have any special cars, any special jets or trains, or any special uh, modes of uh, uh, you know transport. They were walking. So they were riding camels. They were riding horses. Okay. Sometimes they walked for months mm. in order. And what was the purpose? The purpose was not to go and acquire wealth. The purpose was not to go and establish businesses. The purpose was not to go and conquer lands uh, just for the sake of conquering lands, yes, the yes. purpose was to make Islam, the beauty and the justice and the compassion and the mercy of Islam known throughout the world. That was their that purpose. That was their purpose. Mm-hmm. This is why they came out. They had no other material incentives involved. They, they, they could live comfortable lives in Arabia. They were actually quite comfortable in the, in the, in the surroundings. You know, uh, the Arabs, they loved the desert. To this day, if you look at some of the royal families in the Khalij region, what is their best pastime? To go in the desert. Despite the fact that they have access to some of the hotels in 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 New York or some of the holiday destinations in the world, they have the money. They are billionaires, right? Mm-hmm. And their best pastime is going to a desert, sitting on cushions, having kahwa, sipping on some shy, sipping sipping on some shy. With the, with the falcon Camel meat Yeah Camel milk This I mean you, you can go on YouTube And watch some of the royalties yeah. Okay the, If they love it now Boy Despite the fact that They are billionaires They must have Imagine loved it, when yeah. they had nothing yeah. Okay Back in the day yeah. uh, Not that there is a comparison Between what we have now And what, 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 what we had in the past yeah. Unfortunately There's no comparison But The point I'm making is These people love their the the environment mm-hmm. Okay Their habitat but they went out. SubhanAllah. They lost their comfort. Interesting point. Okay. They lost their, their children and their wives. They didn't see their children and wives for years. Mm-hmm. So today we have to fly out for a few weeks. Our wives and our children. Dad, I'm missing you. We're missing you. You disappear. You're not there for us. You don't do anything for us. Moms, the wives are saying, you're spending too much time outside. SubhanAllah. This is not acceptable. Okay. And then you start getting grief. These guys, Ashabu Rasul, Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. They left homes for years. Subhanallah. Okay, months. They were absent for months. And their wives, you know, they had a part, they had a share in the reward because they said, okay, uh, my husband is on the path of Allah. I am equally rewarded for my patience. Allahu Akbar. This is how these people thought. And that's why Islam became a power in the following centuries. The Muslim civilization wasn't uh, spread by eating biryani or having nice tea, okay, or uh, wearing nice clothes. I mean, it helped, right? Okay, it, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> pretty, I, I, I don't think, <laughs> by the way, as a, a side point, I mean, because my field, I'm a, I'm a student of history, Ashab Rasul could not dream of the food you have today. The food you have on your tables, I'm talking to all the Muslims around the world, the desserts, the drinks, the juices, the cocktails, tiramisu. Uh, the type of the types of rice you eat, pilau, okay, biryanis. I don't maybe like ten, there are ten different types. All the niharis, all the pies, okay, all the mandis and all the you know dampochts. I mean, this is a Pashtun dish, you know. Dampo. Mantu. Have you had mantu? Um, I don't know. I mean, there mantu. are so many uh, from Malaysia, mantu. Indonesia, Bangladesh. India, Pakistan, all the way to Morocco. All the dish, all the food you have today, my brothers and sisters. Ashab Rasul, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not even dream of that food. They could not imagine that food. Their food was so simple that, subhanAllah, there are reports that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not eat meat for months, three months, four months. Aisha radiallahu anha, there's a report. 
that for months there wouldn't be fire burning in a house. What does that mean? There's no food. There's no food, and they would be living on dates and milk. Allahu Akbar. Allah. It also shows you. It also shows you how mm-hmm. we've made such a big deal of these things that were seen as like basic. And you know, you know, when you were speaking about Sahaba traveling out, yeah. um, you actually reminded me of um, recently. I learned about a specific scholar of the past. I've forgotten his name. His name escaped my mind, mm-hmm. but. This this narration about the scholar states that when he was young, he went out to study. He went out to study, and even like we hear of like more kind of less extreme examples, like mm. Ibn uh, Ibn Jubair, mm. when he went for Hajj, he traveled yeah. for like two years. Yeah, you know, at the time of the Crusades, yeah. and he wrote a whole well, you know memoir if, on if, it. If, if, I don't yeah. know if you know about this, and you need to know more about your own history. Yeah, your own ancestor, Mr. Musa Musa Adnan, uh, traveled for nearly three years to do Hajj. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I know you know that, that you right? Think I didn't know yeah, Muhammad Subhan. Ismail, your yeah. great great grandfather's gra- uh, father, yeah. uh, Muhammad Ismail, yeah. Rahmatullah, he passed away in 1933. He traveled on foot to do Hajj, and he returned three hour, three, three years later. So, yeah, okay, it's real. before it's you real go to thing. Ibn Jubair and all those personalities, yeah. no, of course, of the but past. this is a point. Like, the, this what? is something closer to home. Yeah, but check this. Check this out. This scholar, like, he he went out to study. Mm. And he came back in like his forties or something, yeah. And his parents didn't recognize him, yeah. And he was like, "I'm your son, like I'm back," Subhan kind of thing, yeah. you know. So this is this is the kind of thing that yeah, would happen. Yeah, so like moving on, all of these things that we've discussed, we discussed them for a reason. Hmm. One of the things that we do at I era um, that I find extremely inspirational hmm. is we have brothers hmm. that go out on a monthly basis, hmm. maybe even like if we were to combine like all of the countries, like currently as we speak. Hmm. We have brother Isa, brother Melo, and mm. some you know some of the team mm. out there, like in the Philippines area. Mm. I mean, they might not even be there right now. They they travel all over that kind yes. of you know area. They're there right now. Yes. Uh, maybe in like a couple of weeks, you're going to be in South Africa or something. Um, yes, inshallah. Yeah, in, Febru- in February. In Southern Africa, yeah. In Southern Africa, like yeah. so, yeah. you're going to be like there. So we're always all over the place, Alhamdulillah, yes. Ayra. Yes. And this is the kind of work that we're involved in heavily, yeah. going and spreading look, that prophetic look, message. Look, I mean. Alhamdulillah, it's fine and well that we go out and do these things and may Allah accept from us. The point I want to make is that what we do is nothing in comparison to the sacrifices of, of the course, Sahaba, no doubt, yeah. of the previous generations, our ancestors, our predecessors. Okay, Because what, what do we do? We board a flight, okay, get top of the range food, although I don't like that food given in, in planes. Okay? I don't know it's if not the best does. food of the world. But you get food, right? And then you land in these airports, top of the range airports with shopping centers, with everything available, easily available. Then you go and you stay in comfortable lodgings, right? And then you jump into a car and then you drive to a destination and do da'wah, okay? We haven't really, really um, done that many sacrifices if you think about it. Yeah. Of course, the time spent abroad, uh, away from your families, um, because we have lived in relative ease. We, in this current day and age, we have relative ease, right? Our lifestyles are a lot easier, a lot more comfortable. By the way, kings in the past didn't live the way we live. Kings, okay? I mean, I was watching this documentary recently, uh, Roosevelt's, uh, and I was looking at this uh, American president, Theodore Roosevelt, who was born in 1858, and he became the president of the US in uh, 1900, right? I looked at his life. He lived, a, he lived a very tough life. Even a century ago, people lived very tough lives. He had to travel to the West to prove himself to be a man before he could be elected president. You know, he had to go and experiment, experience. He went to Africa for an expedition. He went to Brazil, you know, traversing those river, uh, rivers and finding new routes it's through crazy. these rivers. It's crazy stuff, okay? Yeah. You don't imagine Donald Trump doing that today. Okay, uh, living in a tent somewhere in Africa, living in a tent somewhere, okay, mm. uh, and wearing a mask in Brazil just because he doesn't want to get insects biting his face. Uh, people in the past were tough. Their lives are tough. Today our lives are very, very comfortable. Yeah. So comparatively, there may be some hardship yeah, yeah. there, right? Yeah. But in comparison to what the Sahaba endured and what yeah. the Tabi'een and the ulama later on, as, as I, w- I would say as far as the 19th century, we're not going through anything, yeah. seriously, in, in comparison to what they went through, okay, the sacrifices they had to give. Yeah. Perhaps they were mentally prepared for that kind of hardship because this is what they knew. 
Again. That was the no norm for them. Yeah. That isn't the norm for us. If we were put through that kind of hardship, maybe we wouldn't endure. We wouldn't be able to last, right? But because we have a, we've had a different kind of nurturing, different different kind of upbringing, Allah subhanahu wa taala la yukallifu Allahu nafsan illa wasa. Allah does not put a, a burden upon a soul more than it can bear. Yeah. So we are not mentally conditioned for that kind of hardship. They were. I don't think we. They from childhood they grew up in that kind of stuff. Mm. You know, people dying around them was normal. Uh, life expectancy was very very uh, short. People would wouldn't live live beyond thirty, thirty five, forty. Yeah. Most people would die of disease, of you know malnutrition or whatever. There were there were many problems in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So, so comparatively, we're we're not facing a lot of hardship. Yeah. In that sense. Yeah. But um, Alhamdulillah, the work is being done. Uh, the da'wah work. We're using, of course, the facilities that Allah has bestowed upon us. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. To our advantage. Yeah. You know the airplanes and all of these things. Yeah. So how does it feel for someone like yourself? Alhamdulillah, you're you're one of the leads for Aira in Africa. Yeah. You're, you're basically uh, the lead in Africa mm. for Aira. So how does it feel for yourself? Um, you know, we have uh, multiple outreach specialists working in Africa. You're there very regularly, you know, training them, speaking to them, making sure they're doing a good job, mashallah, tabarakallah, in their communities. How does it feel, you know, doing the work of the prophets on the ground? I, I you know, feel you know, that land us foreign. I feel that we're not doing enough. We need to do more. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen our resort. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and mm -hmm. fix our intentions. And I think we need to do a lot more. Is that because, because of things you see on the on the on the on, ground? On the ground, because we 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 are two centuries too late. Really? Yes, because Christian missionaries got there uh, in the 1800s. Okay. Okay, and Africa was not Christian. Africa, I believe, is still not Christian. Most Africans in Southern Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Equator below. Okay, these people are not Christians. Okay. Okay, my experience has taught me when you go and speak to them in the villages, if you ask them, is Jesus God? Do you believe Jesus is God? They will give you a straight answer, no. They actually don't believe Jesus is God. They have been deceived into thinking that the Trinity is not actually what uh, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. Okay, They think Trinity means something different to what they believe in. Oh, sorry, what, what the... Um, what, you know, they have a different kind of understanding of the Trinity. They say Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, they don't actually understand what that means. Most Christians you speak to in Africa, who happen to be in villages, okay, they don't understand what that means. When you talk to them about the Trinity, you tell them the Christians believe that there are three persons within the Trinity and all three are God. Equally. Equally. They're co-eternal and they're co-equal. This is what Orthodox Christianity teaches. When I say Orthodox, I mean Catholics, Protestants, and Orthodox churches. This is what they teach. Do you believe Jesus is God? And they will say no. Really? We've been to so-called Catholic villages where people are wearing crosses. We ask them, do you believe Jesus is God? They will say no. We don't believe Jesus is God okay. because it doesn't make sense to them. Yeah. These people are still upon fitra. Wow. And then why would you, I mean, you would think, why are they Christian then? Why do they call themselves Christians? Mm. Unfortunately, because the missionaries were there to somehow convert them uh, into a version of Christianity they clearly don't understand, okay? And how did they do it? They, they did it through hospitals, through schools, and through humanitarian work. Yeah. Muslims, unfortunately, are already two centuries late. If we were there in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, teaching people about Islam, which is, upon, which is fitra, which is the deen of fitra, it makes sense, there is only one God. There is only one creator who created the heavens and the earth. That one yes. God is not three persons. He is one. Yeah. Right? This makes perfect sense to everyone we speak to in Africa. And we have had people. For example, I've had conversations, personal conversations with Africans. When you speak to them, you tell them that there is only one God. And they say, yeah, absolutely, there's only one God. We don't believe in more than one God. And we say, but you believe in Trinity. Yeah, we believe in the Trinity, but... That's one God. It's just, we don't, yeah. yeah, we don't believe Jesus is God. We yeah. don't believe the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, we believe there is only one God, and they understand the Trinity in a different way. They don't. They, they're not very clear on it. So then I tell some of them that you're a Muslim. You're not a Christian because do you oh, believe you Jesus believe, is a prophet? Yeah. Yes, we believe, believe Jesus was a prophet. Do you believe he was God in flesh? No, we don't believe that. 
We believe he's the son of God. What do you mean by the son of God? They say son of God means someone who came from God to deliver the message of God. So we, we, t- we tell them that's, that means a prophet. That means a messenger. And then we tell them, you are actually a Muslim. You're not even a Christian. You're wearing the wrong badge. And they say, okay, then I'm a Muslim. And they take shahada. We've had, we ha- we've had cases like this. So a lot more needs to be done. Yes. A lot more needs to be done. We need to have more people in Africa teaching people about Islam. Whether people come to Islam or not is not our job. We cannot force people. We cannot push people. We cannot convert people to Islam. Yeah. What we do is we teach them about Islam. And it is their choice what they want to do with their lives. It is their choice. Okay, I believe we need to have more presence. We need to have larger teams going to Africa like the Christian missionaries did in the early 1900s and throughout the 20th century. No, and still do. And and, and because colonial, you know, because Africa was governed by colonial powers. Yes, it was. Many of these countries uh, and what the colonial powers did, they took the money from these lands. Okay. Yes. All the resources. And they put the resources back into the infrastructure. They built schools. They built hospitals. And who was running these schools and hospitals? Christians. Christian missionaries. And they basically... And they basically converted Africans into a version of Christianity they clearly don't understand to this day. And so, I'm, I'm not saying all, all, all Christians in Africa are like that. I'm saying the majority in the rural areas, they don't understand Christianity. They don't know what Christianity is. Yeah. So one of the things that I remember, because I've been in Africa a few times now... Um, Malawi and Uganda, uh, Malawi a couple times, Uganda once, and I remember, and I'm sure you're going to remember this as well, and you still see it. I'm 100 percent sure, um, is that when you when you get on the plane, yeah, it's all um, white Christian missionaries, young like girls, like teenagers, yes. you know, like having a little. You know, like nice trip. Yes. You know, boys, yeah. and they're all going there, kind of. And if you think about it, if you really, really think about it, it's kind of the same colonial mindset. You know, this colonial mindset, like the British had with India. We're coming as a civilizing party. Mm. We're civilized. You're not civilized. Mm. Let us help you become civilized, mm. right? Mm. So it's this kind of same thing. Speaking yeah. down on them. Yeah. We're here with Christianity. Yeah. Teaching you to believe I, in this white Jesus, mm. we're going to civilize you, right? Mm. And that's how it's going to be. So, doesn't that translate in the Dawah as well? Where some people they may react in a way in which, okay, we have because look, there's nuances to these conversations, right? And we want to kind of learn about these nuances because some people, some Muslims out there, may think the Dawah of our era is just pack your bags, get on a flight, go to the country. Do you believe in God? It's not like that. You have to new. You have to. I'm sure. You know, people don't know this and we want to learn about this from you today. People don't know about the nuances you have to deal with. Issues of the country. You know, like you have some of the Indian community living in the countries, etc. And maybe there's certain uh, barriers between the Indian community, you know, that has been there for some time. Yes. And, and the African so, community. So the issue, if, issue, of, issue of missionary influx into Africa, um, you know, it, it, is, it has been ongoing. Yes. And... Uh, to and you still see them, right? To, yeah, absolutely. To this day, every single flight you board, you will have missionaries. Every single one. Guaranteed. I'm saying guaranteed you will have missionaries on it. Going and how to, many? Uh, there would be, I mean, depending on, of course, I mean, sometimes 20, 30, 40. Yeah. And sometimes you can't really, you can't know whether they are missionaries or not. But you see people clearly in uniform. uh from Western countries, and they're not going to places like Malawi for tourism. They're going to places like Malawi to actually preach Christianity to them. And amazingly, believe it, believe it or not, their their focus is the Muslim area. Okay, a lot of these Christian missionaries actually go to Muslim regions in Malawi. Uh, Southern Malawi is predominantly Muslim. Okay, there are three million Muslims there. The largest concentration of Muslims anywhere in Southern Africa. In Malawi. In Malawi. Wow. It's a very small country. The largest concentration of Muslims anywhere in Africa, in Southern Africa, sorry, in Southern Africa is in Malawi, which is a very small country. It's a very poor country. It's like an entire tribe of people converted to Islam sometime in the past. And it's the Yao tribe. Okay. And about 3 million people are Muslims. And a lot of the Christian missionary activity takes place in these areas. Yes. Or in this particular region. Okay. So you're right that there is an influx and uh, to give them credit, they are doing a good job for their own community. They're very dedicated. Some of them go and live in villages. They spend a lot of time teaching what they think is the truth. As right? in the Christians. The Christian missionaries, okay. right? 
On the other hand, with with Ayura, with the Muslims, we are facing many challenges. Okay, so okay. Like, tell us about. For example, that. we are new, we are relatively new to this field. Okay, uh, we face many problems. We we firstly we don't have the colonial infrastructure backing us. Yeah. Okay, uh, Christianity spread throughout Southern Africa, as I already stated earlier, through the support of colonial. Uh, apparatus, colonial governments. They were actually directly backing missionary activity, establishing schools for them. And this money came from these very countries, yeah. from the resources, from the diamonds, from the gold, from the from the minerals, whatever the colonial powers were were, were able to extract and spend some of it, fractions of it, on slave, the people. Slave trade? Uh, no, slave trade was abolished okay. dominantly by, by, then, okay. by, by then. In the 20th century, it was already abolished. Okay, even in Western countries, it was abolished in the 19th century. And then this was actually one of the pretexts these colonial powers used to civilize the Africans that we will now abolish slave trade. We have come to abolish slave trade. Okay, we are here to help you. So this was, this was one of the pretexts uh, used by colonial powers. And this was some of the missionaries were doing, like people like David Livingston. Yes. Um, uh, they were using this pretext to go there and preach Christianity. And some of them did. To their credit, some of them did. Of course, they, they did fight against uh, slave trade in whatever form it was there. Uh, and uh, they managed to successfully do away uh, with slavery. And then that's why a lot of people, they converted to Christianity. It was a very okay. Christian yeah. movement, the abolition movement. Yeah, uh, abolition. Uh, in the 19th century, because that's where the worst type of slavery was taking place. Yeah. It was in the Christian world. Atlantic slave trade was mainly driven by Christendom, right? It was a Western phenomenon, right? Atlantic slave trade that continued for almost four centuries, where Africans were picked up from West African countries and then taken across the and Atlantic. And then you see people like Wilberforce, uh, like, you know, fighting yeah, against it. Absolutely. From a Christian perspective. Because it had reached its peak. Atlantic slave trade had reached its peak in the 18th century. And obviously, there, there is going to be a reaction. Yeah. Uh, literally, as we say in our street language, they took the mick. <laughs> you know, in the 18th century, they started to take the mick, uh, these slave traders or slavers. They were picking up too many people. Uh, there is an estimate that uh, close to 100 million people, between yeah. 100 to 11 million. I mean, historians say it, the number can be, can be anywhere between 11 to 100 million people removed from their homes, from the countries, uh, from Western African countries predominantly, and taken across the Atlantic. And 30% of them... British ships. Uh, 30% of them were uh, dumped into the sea for a number of different reasons. Some of them got sick. They, they would be thrown overboard. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were thrown into the sea for insurance fraud, for example, you know, because they were chattel. They were, this was chattel slavery. So uh, mm -hmm. stock, okay, would be insured with companies in London. So to claim insurance, right, they would throw people into the sea uh, so that they can claim insurance. Supreme. And for this... Millions, millions were thrown into the sea. Sometimes children hanging on to the breasts of their mothers were thrown into the sea with the mothers. There are some movies you can watch to give you um, some idea. There is a movie called Amistad. You should watch it. There's a movie called uh, uh, Amazing Grace uh, that also gives you an insight into... There's even books uh, like 12 Years a Slave. And to, I mean, th these are slave narratives. Yeah. Uh, Oloda Equiano. Uh, his personal story. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then we have uh, Solomon Northup, who wrote this book called 12 Years a Slave. Uh, and a movie was made about that as well. There are other slave narratives, like Frederick Douglass. He wrote a narrative of his own life. Later on, he became an abolitionist and he was working with the American political establishment to abolish it in the South. And lo and behold, hence the the Civil War. So we, we, won't, we don't want to go into that. Coming back yeah. to Africa. Ayera is mainly involved in building bridges yeah. between organizations, okay. bringing people together for the future. Okay, yeah. And we're not simply there as missionaries. We are, we're there to, to, to facilitate ease uh, for the people where we, where, we, where, we, where we are doing da'wah, for example. Okay? We are edu educating them about Islam. We are reaching out to Muslims. We are uh, simply trying to inspire them okay, about Islam why Islam uh, is the right, because a lot of the Muslims in places like Malawi or other countries for that matter, 
their knowledge of Islam is very minimal, very limited. So this is where the nuances and exactly, stuff come exactly. In. So we go and get them involved in da'wah with us, so that they can do it. And when they get involved in da'wah, they start to learn. They start to learn about the basics of Islam, and they get inspired. Okay. Then we establish teams on the ground mm-hmm. who are doing da'wah full time on full time basis. They go to villages. They teach people about Islam. And if there are any Muslims, if people decide to convert to Islam, then they teach them how to pray the basics of Islam. Right. Uh, then we work on building relationships with local organizations, getting them involved through their guidance. Through the supervision, because yes. we we are not walking into these countries arrogantly, as if we are thinking we are the British civilizers of humanity. We're going to come in and we're going to start civilizing the locals. No, it doesn't work like that. That's why we employ the first, people local. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The first thing we do, we go to locals. Yes. The Muslims. Yes. We we talk to them. We seek their advice and their supervision and their blessings. Local organizations, local elders. We did this in Nigeria. We did this in Ghana. We did this in Malawi. We did this in Zambia. Uh, there are each country comes with, comes with its own challenges, right? So we have to work on those challenges and fix the problems or remove obstacles from uh, the path of dawa. Okay, if there is anything stopping the dawa in those countries, we work on removing those obstacles by talking to influentials, business people, duaat, and bring them together on the same page. So Aira has. Uh, a lot of things uh, about it. It's not simply going, packing your bags, going to a yes. village, f- taking some footage and walking, walking, walking out. No, it's not like that. Yes. We are doing a lot of um, grassroots work. Okay, where we are trying to establish local organizations who will who will do dawa on their own, inshallah. And correct me if I'm wrong. That yeah. th- this philosophy of 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 getting people from within them to give them dawa is an Islamic concept. You know. Yeah. Um, like uh, Allah, yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah mm-hmm. Qaf mm-hmm. mentions بَلْ عَجِبُوا أَنْ جَاءَهُمْ مُنْذِرٌ مِّنْهُمْ Absolutely. Yeah. So like فَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا شَيْءٌ عَجِيبٌ yes. like yeah. yeah, they, 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 they are surprised that uh, a warner came from, 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 from themselves. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And in Surah, Surah Al-Hajj, Allah also mentions that Allah sent prophets to speak to people in their own languages. Yeah. So imagine if we go arrogantly into Africa with that we have come from Britain, we know yeah. the English language, I have a degree. It's from like this colonizing a, type no, thing. No, 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 no. Yeah. We don't encourage that. We don't yeah. promote that. We tell people that you are the leaders of your people. You give them you, the you give you teach them yes. you teach them yes. we are simply here to learn from you if anything they actually know some some of them actually know more than us when we go and teach i mean we, we get humbled by our african brothers some, some of them some mashallah of them are quote, graduates, yeah. they are graduates from medina from yeah. al-azhar from places like that and yeah. we are we're trying no. to teach them no we have no place to teach them we simply support share them. some uh, yeah some ideas with them and give them support where necessary, maybe with materials and other things, inshallah ta'ala. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. inshallah. So our strategy is is multifaceted. Yes. It is not simply going in there, packing your bags, spend one week or two weeks and coming out. No, we are working with local organizations to establish <coughs> uh, da'wah in these lands, in these countries. And alhamdulillah, yeah. so far so good. And I, th- I and I think that our team is very dedicated to do that. Mashallah, you know, Salahuddin actually mentioned something to me earlier. Salahuddin is our global manager. You know, he manages uh, the global kind of you know stays in touch with everyone, yourself and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, he was mentioning to me how um, you actually mentioned to him that you want to die in Africa. I don't know if that was a joke or it was a like a serious point. Well, you know? Alhamdulillah, <laughs> if, if it happens, and what, what 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 I mean, come on. If you die in Africa, and why are you in Africa in the first place? You get the, you're there to give da'wah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the Christians done that. David yeah, Livingston uh, yeah, died if in you Africa. die in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you die in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What better way to be resurrected? I mean, if the Christians are willing to do that and wear yeah, upon the truth, absolutely. You David know, Livingston. Uh, no, let me tell you something. Yeah. Forget David Livingston. Yeah, he died in Africa, no yeah, doubt. He died okay? from malaria, uh, right? No, no, no. He, uh, uh, we, we're not sure what, what he, how he died. Okay. Uh, his, his body was kept, okay, um, and this happened in 1870s, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, 1874, when his body was brought back to Liverpool and he was given a 21-gun salute by the, the government at that time and he became a sensation within his lifetime, right? Uh, actually, yeah. he published a book, Adventures in Southern Africa, in 1857. Yes. And that book made him a celebrity in Britain, yes. uh, someone who is actually going out to spread the word of Christ, okay, or the message of Christ. Um Right as the Christians saw it, okay. Yeah. Of course, we don't agree that that's the message of, of Christ. Not. The Christ never not. taught 
the Trinity. Okay, so uh, there was a story about David Livingston that he that he was attacked by a lion, and that image became, um, you know, a household image. You know, it was on matchboxes, it was mm. on in newspapers, it was on posters, it was everywhere. So he inspired a revolution. So potentially, Aira is doing something like that as well to inspire a dawa. Uh, movement Aira is sending people out so that they can do dawa okay and they can become an inspiration for those who haven't yet uh, got involved in dawa sometimes precedents work david livingston himself was a failure he himself personally didn't achieve much in africa really? right no 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 he didn't he could hardly convert anyone i mean he's promoted as if he he did he because his precedent hmm. did the job like what he not, said there. not no, what the, the fact example. that he went out there, the lived there, and died there, right? That was an example for many Christian missionaries around the world, and they got inspired and they started to travel to Africa. And, they go to and the then yeah. now there is a beach in Malawi called Livingstonia. Okay, there are hundreds of missionaries buried there. Hundreds died of malaria. So the question is, where are these Muslims? Where are these Muslims who it's believe fine. in the Haq, who it's believe fine. in the truth? We are always very humanitarian uh, to claim <laughs> virtue we are very quick to claim the the noble uh, nobility of islam we are very quick to say that we are muslims we kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrajat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhauna 'anil munkar we are quick to claim that honor yeah, yeah. but we are missing from africa from south america from southeast asia we are are people giving dawah on the ground. But like to bring some nuance. Of course, Tablighi Jamaat, mashallah, they are doing a great job. Yeah. I mean, again, credit must be given where it's due. But they are focusing on Muslims. Yeah. Tablighi Jamaat, they are completely focused on Muslims, right? Where are the people, Muslims, giving dawah to non-Muslims? There, there's a thing here. There's a point yeah. here. There's a nuance here. Because yeah. some people will respond and say, hey, hang on. We are in all of these countries. Look, you know, we have all of these other charities. But you see, now the point is this. Yeah. As Muslims, and I'm sure you're going to agree with me here, mm. we've become so heavily centered and focused on humanitarian aid. Yeah. Where if you turn on an Islamic channel mm. in Ramadan, yeah. it's only humanitarian aid. Yeah. And if you, actually, if some people saw like a, a charity like Aero Fundraising to give dawah, it's like, what do these guys think? It's a bit weird. But, but, but this is the thing. We've put it in our heads. That yeah. feeding these people and uh, that's important. Feeding yeah. these people and giving them clothing and shelter is is the most important thing. Absolutely. When but at Islam, the same time, at the same, the, it's both. No, it's but both. they have to know this is because of the compassion of Islam. And and they don't unfortunately. Yeah, I don't. Unfortunately, I don't feel yeah. they don't. So this is why when we do humanitarian work, there has to be dawa element. We have to explain to people why, why, why the Muslims are doing this charity. We are doing this charity because charity is the third pillar of Islam. Okay, after Shahada and Salah. It is zakah. Subhanallah. Okay. Yeah. Then sadaqah. Okay. We believe in sadaqah. We believe sadaqah is the best thing a Muslim may, may do in his life. Sadaqah, it averts troubles. It averts uh, calamities. Right? So, we have to explain to the people when we do humanitarian work that the reason we are doing it is because of Islam. Because of, because of Allah. Because Allah has commanded us to do it. So, there has to be dawah element. Okay. Uh, so, with compassion... With um, generosity must come the reasons as to why you are compassionate. Like the ayah in the Quran, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَ أَحَدُكُمُ الْمَوْتِ فَيَقُولَ رَبِّ لَوْ لَا أَخَرْتَنِي إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ قَرِيبٍ فَأَصَّدَّقَ وَأَكُمْ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ Absolutely, right? yes. Where, where the person on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he's saying, hmm. you know, he's expressing, and I'm paraphrasing the whole ayah, hmm. but he's saying, Ya Allah, send me back. You know, so that I can do what for us sadaka. Like mm. th these, mm. these shaddas. Mm. These they're they're mm. for emphasis in the Arabic language. So, so, so here, what we learn is well, here we will uh, in this powerful verse. What do we learn? The sadaka, sadaka is something yeah. very powerful. Okay, now wait. In another verse in the Quran, Allah says, "Audo billahi min shaitan rajim, wa man ahsanu qawlan min man daa ila Allahi wa amila salihan wa qala inna ni min al muslimin." Yeah, subhanallah. Whose word is better than the one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds? Now, amazingly, we talked about the righteous deed. Sadaqah. Yeah. Allah is saying the best people are the ones who are causing to Allah, calling to Allah, who are calling to Allah and are doing righteous deeds. So someone who is doing sadaqah and da'wah together, Allahu Akbar, you're the best person. Yeah. 
Because sadaka is one of the best deeds in Islam. Allah says, who is best yeah. in speech? Yes. Than the one, and that's so you're the best in speech. Yes. And also in terms of actions, actions. the one on Yom Al Qiyamah, he's gonna wish he could come back and do sadaqa. Absolutely. You're doing both. So if you combine da'wah with sadaqa, Allahu Akbar, this yeah. is the greatest thing you may do in your life, and it will show in your children. It will show in your children. I believe, I firmly believe that whatever little Islam we practice, myself and my children, I believe. You know, Musa, mashallah. You know, I'm. By the way, I shouldn't say this, uh, uh, but I'm very proud of him, mashallah. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him, may Allah mm -hmm. continue to strengthen him. You know, I believe whatever little Islam or whatever Islam he's practicing and trying to, you know, uh, study is not because of me. I believe it is the dua and the actions Sorry. of my ancestors. I believe some of my ancestors did good deeds. They were sincere in those good deeds. They probably got onto the masala and they prayed, oh Allah, make our progeny. Uh, good people, make them noble people. Maybe, maybe we we are very sinful. We are very sinful, but the fact that we continue to pray is someone's du'a driving us. I don't believe it's because of us. It's because of me or because of so, Musa. Yeah. It is someone's du'a, someone's sacrifices, someone's sincerity driving us. I believe that. Yeah. Even the Quran, Rabbi Jalli Mukimus Salati wa min dhuriyati wa min dhuriyati. Rabbana wa taqabbal du'a. Okay. Oh Allah, establish salah in my dhuriyah. This is the dua of Ibrahim alayhi salam, okay? And I'm pretty sure I, our ancestors are making this dua. And we should continue to make this dua. Oh Allah, make a dhuriya uh, of those who pray and who are noble people. And they will become noble people. And leave a precedent for them. Leave a, set a precedent for your progeny, for, for, you, for your children, that they can look back and take inspiration, okay? I recently did a lecture on Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan. Yeah. He was a great scholar from India in yeah. the 19th century. Yeah. Okay, and he became a king. His story is absolutely fascinating. And those who want to learn more about him, there's a lecture on my YouTube channel, Nawab Siddiq Hassan Khan. Okay, he, he was a great scholar, well known to uh, the scholar of Hijaz because he produced close to 200 works. Wow, yeah, amazing scholar. Okay, I know some of his descendants today, yes, and yeah. a lot of them are not practicing. After that lecture. Some of them messaged me privately and they said, I am crying. I said, I'm crying. So what? They said, we had no idea that we descended from someone like that. And this person has inspired me. My ancestor, who was like that. And they have his name in their name. Yeah, Islam, yeah, right? absolutely. They have Hassan, Siddiqa, you know, they all of them, yeah, Hassan, Hassan yeah, Khan. yeah. You know some of them. I know some of them, yeah. Right? And they took inspiration from their ancestor. So if you do a good deed for the sake of Allah, remember, it will not be wasted. It will be remembered by your descendants. They will get to know it. Allah will make sure that they will know it and they will act upon it. And because of your little sincerity and your little good deeds, your descendants will be saved from hellfire, inshallah. inshallah as inshallah. long as you start to, you continue to pray for them, inshallah. inshallah. And on that note, Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much. I'll see you at home. I'm inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an amazing podcast with you, inshallah. We look forward to having you on again, inshallah, for more topics. So brothers and sisters, as you have seen with Rerouted, Alhamdulillah, we're trying to get more out of the guests. We're trying to bring the guests on again and again and again, inshallah, get more out of them, speak about some topics for all of you guys, inshallah. The last podcast with uh, my father, Adnan Rashid, you guys really liked the history bit, so we thought we'll bring more of that in, inshallah, and speak a bit of, uh, you know, about the work that we do in Africa as Aira. Please do support us, inshallah. This is not something that I normally say, but, um, you know, Aira, we are uh, an organization that's funded it's a charity organization. We're a charity. So please do try and support us, inshallah, the work that we do. We have many people, brothers sacrificing their time. And of course, it's not comparable to the brothers, you know, to, to the Sahaba, our brothers, inshallah, uh, from the past who've done amazing work, you know, uh, and they sacrificed their whole life and their time with their families. But it's something that we're trying to do, inshallah, to carry on that path, the path of the prophets. May Allah bless all of you. Listen to us on all major podcast platforms, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And we'll see you in the next episode. Peace out. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.